At face value, democracy seems like a very simple concept. It's a system which vests power in the people to elect their leaders. This can be done in a variety of ways, from the federalized representative democracy of the United States to the direct elections of the Swiss, from Britain's constitutional monarchy to France's aggressive republicanism. From our modern lens, democracy is the default, but historically, it's not. Throughout history, the vast majority of societies have been monarchies and aristocracies. Since the fall of the Roman Republic all the way up to the Enlightenment just a few hundred years ago, it was a seldom considered idea. There's a fairly simple reason for this, and that's that democracy is fragile. It's one of the most fragile political systems ever conceived, and it can only be held up by the constant support of the people. Every time democracy falls in a nation, it's because the people have become disenchanted with it and have lost the interest in maintaining it. And this is where I arrive in Russia. After the end of the Cold War, many in the West were hoping for new democratic nations, but this was not to be. It's been only 29 years since the Soviet flag was last raised over Moscow, and yet Russia, along with many former Eastern Bloc nations, has relapsed into authoritarianism and corruption. To understand this, we must go back to the collapse of the USSR. Russia's emergence from the communist era was far more violent than most of the Soviet republics. In June of 1991, Boris Yeltsin was elected president of the RSFSR, and began calling for independence from the Soviet Union. In August, a group of hardline communists in the government put Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev under house arrest, and proclaimed themselves to be the rightful government, hoping to reverse his liberalizing reforms. Within just a few days, though, the coup had failed, with the Russian people rallying around Yeltsin. On Christmas Eve of that year, Gorbachev resigned as President of the Soviet Union, and the next day the Soviet Union was officially dissolved. Two years, one parliament storming, and 187 dead people later, Russia got a new constitution. In the latter half of his second term, Yeltsin became increasingly erratic, and many believe he drank excessively. By 1999, his approval rating was abysmal. Russia's economy was a mess, and an oligarch class had rapidly risen under his administration, and now comprised his only real remaining base of support. It isn't just that Yeltsin was unpopular, he was the first politician that Russians trusted, and the only freely elected head of state in Russian history. Yeltsin rode the wave of popular support he made people hopeful for their future, and he ended up resoundingly disappointing them. Under Yeltsin's rule, there was massive economic inflation which destroyed the life savings of many an already struggling Russian, and although overall quality of life went up, economic inequality grew worse. The Russian constitution established a two-term limit, so even if Yeltsin was healthy enough to do so, which he wasn't, he couldn't run again. This left him and his cabinet, who I kid you not were called the family, with the difficult job of choosing a successor. Now, between March of 1998 and his leaving office, Yeltsin appointed and dismissed no less than four prime ministers. The last of those prime ministers was the man who would end up succeeding Yeltsin, but first we have to rewind a bit. This is Boris Berezovsky. To understand the state of Russia today, you have to understand this man. Berezovsky was one of Russia's oligarchs, and he was fiercely loyal to Yeltsin, seemingly not just because of his wealth. He had met and befriended a certain Vladimir Putin in 1990, and now we return to 1999, with Yeltsin frantically casting about for a successor. For quite some time, Berezovsky had been trying to convince Putin into being Yeltsin's successor, and in July, Putin finally agreed. In August, he was confirmed as Russia's Prime Minister. Just a couple weeks later, the semi-independent Chechen Republic of Shkidia invaded the Autonomous Republic of Dagestan, more commonly referred to as Russia, thus kicking off the Second Chechen War. A series of apartment bombings rocked the nation, and Putin responded in vulgarity, saying that we will hunt them down, we will destroy them, and there is no border with Chechnya. Now, among Berezovsky's many investments, he was also the head of Channel One, Russia's primary news source, and he used the full force of the media to back Putin and discredit his opponents. He helped to found the Unity Party, which would later merge into Putin's current United Russia. It was a party based not around ideology or some common set of values, but around people or in our case, one specific person, Vladimir Putin. 
As the year marched on, the idea was brought up within the family that Yeltsin should resign on New Year's Eve. This would make Putin, as the Prime Minister, the acting president until the election three months later. This was an act of pure genius. Not only did it give Putin an explosive entry into the public eye, it also gave him time to disassociate with the failed administration of Yeltsin and establish himself in Russian politics. On the eve of the 21st century at midnight, following shortly after Yeltsin's resignation speech, Putin appeared on television and made a toast to Russia's new century. As it turned out, there wouldn't be very much new about it. Using a strongman image, control over the media through Berezovsky, and a largely successful military campaign in Chechnya, Putin coasted to an easy victory in the 2000 election. After that, things degraded at lightning speed. Democracy on Russia was already on the brink of collapse and was only holding on because Yeltsin, for all its corruption, his drunkenness, and his nepotism, was still an ardent believer in democracy. Putin, on the other hand, had openly expressed his disdain for democracy since his days as an advisor to the mayor of St. Petersburg. In August of that year, the submarine Kursk sank, taking the entire crew with it. In the aftermath, a Channel One journalist named Sergei Derenko ran a segment where he extensively criticized Putin. Shortly afterwards, Putin ordered Berezovsky to hand over his shares of Channel One. Berezovsky flatly refused, and a few days later, he fled to France with an arrest warrant hanging over his head. Within a year of Putin's election, his government controlled all three of Russia's major news networks. Now let's fast forward by three and a half years to the election of 2004. Putin's opponents stood no chance. Many people like to accuse Putin of rigging elections, but for the most part it's not Putin's government that rigs elections, but rather it is Putin's people. In his first election campaign, Putin tapped into a certain nostalgia for the Soviet Union. Not so much for the communist ideology, which had lost any political relevance long ago, but instead the desire to restore Russia as a great power on the world stage. He reactivated the instincts which had been so deeply ingrained in the Russian people by Soviet leaders. The instincts to serve the state loyally and blindly. To the Russian people, Putin was the physical embodiment of the state, and so across the country, citizens did what they could to serve their president. Everywhere they went, opposition candidates were simply refused by the people. Refused space for campaign rallies, refused to print campaign leaflets, refused to have their campaign ads air on television, and it certainly didn't help that there were five of them. Putin won with an absurd 71% of the vote. In September of that year, Chechen terrorists took an elementary school in the town of Bezlan hostage, demanding full Russian withdrawal from Chechnya and a recognition of Chechen independence. Over the following three days, the situation escalated until federal troops attempted to storm the school. 334 of the hostages, including 186 children, died. The Russian people were traumatized, and Putin used this tragedy as a crowbar, or rather as a knife, to kill Russian democracy for good. In a closed-door meeting with his cabinet, along with Russia's 89 governors, he said that we have to act. We have to increase the effectiveness of the government in combating the entire complex of problems facing the country. The unity of the country is the main condition of success in the fight against terrorism. Russian governors were now to be appointed by the president rather than elected, and Russian citizens would no longer vote for candidates, but rather for parties who would then choose who to fill the seats with. And lastly, the president would now personally appoint a body called the Civic Chamber, which would review any bills passed in the parliament. And so as these laws were passed, Russian democracy, which since its inception had been on life support, died. The rest, as they say, is history. With Putin's power secured, the imprisonment and or murder of opposition figures has become commonplace, and many of the oligarchs who brought him to power have been removed as a threat. In 2008, with Putin's two terms expired, he chose a man by the name of Dmitry Medvedev as his successor. Medvedev easily won the election with over 70% of the vote, and upon inauguration, appointed Putin as his prime minister. It was very clear who was truly in power in Russia. Medvedev was a simple figurehead, and a few months after the election, a bill was passed extending the presidential term to six years, though this would not apply to Medvedev. In September 2011, Medvedev expressed his support for the candidacy of Putin, and indeed, Putin won with 63% of the vote. Since then, he's been the president of Russia, and his term will expire in 2024, though it's looking like Russia may soon abolish presidential term limits altogether, allowing his reign to continue well into the 2030s. From Russia, we in the West, and more specifically in America, can and should learn several very important lessons. The first is that, as I said at the start, democracy is fragile. Without the support of the people, it is doomed to collapse. 
The second is that the media is incredibly powerful. It can make or unmake someone as it pleases, and so a corrupted media will inevitably lead to a corrupted democracy. The third is that politics driven by personality rather than policy is a very dangerous and slippery slope. In the West, there is a growing apathy for democratic institutions, along with an ever-increasing support for populist and often authoritarian measures. Our media no longer seeks to report the truth and hold politicians up to scrutiny. Rather, it engages in petty squabbles over things that are utterly irrelevant, and at this point is nothing more than a propaganda tool for whichever party it supports. Our politics are being driven increasingly by the sheer force of will of our leaders rather than the policies they wish to implement to help people. The promise of 1991 was the promise of democracy, prosperity, and liberty in Russia. Instead, they got authoritarianism, poverty, and repression. The promise of 1776 was the promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in America. If we are not careful, if we are not constantly vigilant, that promise too will be lost, and we too will go the way of Russia. Auf einer Bahnstation, tausend Meilen hinter Brest. Unser Zug geht kurz, da sahen wir die zwei stehen. Einen Mann mit seinem Sohn, dessen Haar war kurz geschoren. I'd like to thank you for watching. Although the video wasn't very long, it was by far my biggest project yet, and most of my research came from a book by Russian journalist Masha Gessen entitled The Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin. If you want a more detailed look at this topic, I recommend you to read this book. You can find a link to my Discord server in the description where I'll be polling the server members on what the next video should be. Till then, do svidanya.